Series 5 is here! At this point, we've been putting out episodes for just over two months now, and we still can't believe the amazing reception we've gotten. You are all absolutely fantastic. Yeah, we we hope that you enjoyed last week's Character Evolution Cast episode. We had an absolute blast creating it, and we are so excited about some of the topics that we have planned for future episodes. We also have another review to read, as is tradition. Uh, This one is titled, Just Punched, Already a Must Listen, from Zion Nova from Canada. Character Creation Cast just launched a little over two weeks ago, and it's already one of my favorite listens. Amelia and Ryan are incredibly thoughtful in their approach and analysis of the systems that they're looking at, and the guests that they bring on board are phenomenal. This podcast is an incredible amalgam of RPGs, the wholesomeness of their communities, and in-depth analysis that makes everything approachable to newcomers as well as seasoned veterans. Truly a gem of a podcast and a gem of a media in general. (laughs) That's awesome. Thank you so much, Zionova. Thank you so much. Awesome. With all of that, here is the episode. Enjoy. Character Creation Cast, a show where we discuss and create characters, the best part of role-playing games, with guests using their favorite systems. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia, and this episode, my co-host Ryan and I welcome the wonderful folks from the Redemption Podcast, a Star Wars actual play podcast on the RPG Academy Network, for another stellar episode. We are here to discuss character creation for Edge of the Empire, a Star Wars role-playing game system published by Lucas Books and Fantasy Flight Games. Welcome to Character Creation Cast, everyone. We're really excited to have you here with us. Well, thanks for having us. We're moderately excited to be here. <laughs> <laughs> that's I, than I, I would say higher than moderate. I would say satisfied. Yes. I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm satisfied to be here. <laughs> All right. We're well, satisfied well, to have you. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Exactly. Aww. All right, well, let's start by introducing everyone to our audience. Uh, We can start with Chris. Can you tell us a bit more about yourself and any other projects you are currently involved in? Uh, Well, currently I am the Game Master uh, for the Redemption Podcast, and I'm also a player in a Shadow of the Demon Lord actual play called Tales of Blood and Stone. Uh, I've been gaming for a while, almost 27 years now, and just been loving doing the podcasting thing and i'm i'm glad and excited you guys asked us to be on yeah definitely thank you so much for being here and michael we're also joined by you can you tell us a bit more about yourself and your current projects um yeah i michael i play tazi on the redemption podcast uh in addition to redemption podcast i'm also in the tales of blood and stone podcast with chris again a shadow of the demon lord game and then on uh, Sunday evenings, I stream with the Return to Greyhawk show on the Greyhawk channel on Twitch. Also uh, a new member of the RPG Academy Network. I can also be found guesting on a number of shows doing strange voices and things. Um, uh, whenever I am asked to record, I almost always say yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You can hear hear Michael in uh, two separate episodes of Shadow of the Cabal. Mm-hmm. Very nice. Indeed. Indeed. Thank you, Michael. Uh, last but not least, we have the newest member of Redemption. Emily, can you tell us about yourself and some of the million other things you have going on? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm Emily, and I play Isla Zarla on Redemption, the memory-challenged Duro. <laughs> She's wonderful to play, and I love her, and it's been wonderful to come on to Redemption. My longest-running podcast is She's a Super Geek, which I co-host with Senda, and... She's pretty popular. And then I've got Wednesday evening podcast All-Stars. We are currently in my Dungeons & Dragons world of Avanti, and I'm D- I'm DMing a campaign called Blood and Glitter. Sorry, no, sorry, opposite. Glitter and Blood. 
Nice. It depends on how you listen to it. If you know there's blood cl- coming, you see it in the glitter first, but <laughs> it starts cool. out a little bit lighter. Awesome. Um, so those are the, but I've, I've done some voice acting and other things, but those are the, those are the, those are the big things. Very cool. Well, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, how about we jump right into finding out what this game is all about? What's in a game? Okay, let's do it. I'm ready. Ready, go. <laughs> okay, let's start with the setting for Edge of the Empire in particular. That's kind of where we wanted to focus this. Um, most people are at least familiar with Star Wars to a degree. Um, what period of Star Wars are we talking when we play Edge of the Empire? Edge of the Empire is set after the Clone Wars when the Empire has taken control of the galaxy, as they call it, or the systems. The big thing with Edge of the Empire and kind of the time period and setting is the fact that the Empire, they they weren't very nice. They drove species off their planets or enslaved them or just outright kind of brutalized and took over several systems and force people to do exactly what the Emperor wanted them to do. Uh, most of the games are going to be set uh, outside of the Empire, and most people are going to be playing smugglers or bounty hunters or people that are working outside of what the Empire allows them to do right now. Wait, the Empire's bad? <laughs> are you sure? Depending upon your point of view, I mean, <laughs> yeah. technically within the system, you could play a member of the Empire. Mm-hmm. Probably not going to be the nicest guy. Or perhaps you're just brainwashed and you think you're doing the right thing. It's really kind of up to what you want to do. Or you can play a character with amnesia. You could. And not need to worry about all of that. Yes, you could. Is this just because you didn't feel like writing a backstory? (laughs) Oh, no. What's funny is I have the backstory. That's fine. It's, it's, I didn't, I was worried about my Star Wars knowledge and also taking an NPC to a PC. It was kind of like let's add some some mystery and depth Mm -hmm. and let chris said that this will let me take her in my own sort of way i didn't have to stick with her the backstory that was placed on her yeah that was that was a decision emily and i made to pretty much free her up to do what she wanted to with the character and wasn't Mm -hmm. just set into what i had already kind of written Uh, it just seemed like the easiest way to uh, allow her to do what she wants to do as yeah. opposed to railroading her character into one direction. And that yeah, is a decision he cool. has regretted ever since. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> okay, so what do characters do then in Edge of the Empire um, aside from the types of things that they can be? You know, to kind of go off of what Chris is talking about, especially with the time period, I mean, you're talking about a large number of people that are living you know, outside of the comfort of the empire, they're either being held down by them or, or manipulated by them in some way. And I think the characters that people tend to make in an edge of the empire setting are those that are trying to make a way for themselves, right? Mm -hmm. They may, they may not be fighting the empire. That might not be their goal. It may simply be to be able to put some, you know, food on the table and make it to the next job. Um, Oftentimes they are maybe shadier characters, uh, they might be smugglers, as, as Chris said. They might be pilots. They might be mechanics just looking for a way to live and, and get by mm-hmm. or and get one over on the Empire at the same time. Um, it really all depends on what you want to do with your character. And as we've seen in Star Wars, there's certainly a plethora of ways that you could take somebody and make them interesting and, and, and make them uh, fun to play. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Very cool. So outside of the rule book, um, what other things do you need to sit down and play a game of Edge of the Empire? Uh, Fantasy Flight Games did design a dice system for this. They call it the narrative dice. So instead of having numbers, they have symbols. So you have positive dice and difficulty dice. Uh, You build a dice pool based off of that. So you do need their narrative dice. It's a great system because you have degrees of failure and degrees of success. So it's not like a D20 system where, oh, you succeed or you fail. There's different levels mm-hmm. within the system. Mm-hmm. So you do need the, the dice for that for sure. And there are um, a lot of apps and things that you can yes. or online. Um, and I think I'm sure Roll20 has, has yes. that built in probably, right? 
Yes. I say, I'm sure they do, probably. <laughs> um, they have, well, I don't know about Roll20, but Fantasy Flight has both the Star Wars specific dice, and also they just released the um, more more generalized sort of narrative dice system called Genesis. So you mm-hmm. can also pick up, it, you know, it doesn't have the, the rebel symbol on it or anything, but it has the same Are they the percentage. same color? Like yeah, the same colors. Yeah. Okay, cool. Cool. FFG, they also offer a, basically a free dice app. So you can download an app for your iPhone or for your Android device that will roll dice for you if you can't find a set of dice or or they are – I mean they are a little bit of an expense. I believe one basic set of dice I think for either system is $15. Yeah. Uh, 15 retail. All right. Um, so aside from the dice, what would you guys say is uh, unique about Edge of the Empire? I, I would say one of the biggest things that's nice about Edge of the Empire – Everybody has access to all the skills, so you don't have characters that are limited based on their career, as they call it in this game. Other games are called a class. So if you want to have a slicer that's also really good at shooting a gun, he has access to the skill. It's not like it's blocked off and he can't get there. It's Mm -hmm. something that everybody can do. Everybody can try to slice into a computer and open up the door. It doesn't have to be the computer hacker. So if the computer hacker is busy, somebody else can try to do it. I think it frees up people to create better stories and allows their characters to have more options. You know, in other other systems, the thief is the one that's going to be opening the door. In this system, it could be, you know, your tank, so to speak. Maybe he's the guy that's really good at opening doors. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that's neat. The talents are real nice. They are kind of like feats in other games. So your career has talent trees you can go down and kind of customize your character. You can have a thief that maybe he leans more towards the social end. So one side of the tree is going to have more social skills. The other side might have more of your sneaky skills. It's more open than other systems. Okay. I think it allows you to build characters a lot easier and do more with them later. Right. So it's not as, um, you're not like on a track to kind of be like once you make that initial decision, you can still kind of branch out from there. Yes, and you can even take other careers later on, too. So, like, for example, the droid that uh, is on our show, A1, he started off as a mechanic who had a lot of good slicing skills. I then gave him the slicer um, career, and later he started gambling, so I gave him the career of gambler. So he actually has (laughs) three careers. Emily, what do you think is a unique aspect of, of Edge of the Empire? What I really like about Edge of the Empire is that it takes a lot of the the things you love about Star Wars but really gives you the ability to tell your own story which I think is one of the things that we all love about Star Wars like the the movies focus on you know obviously a bunch of individual characters and whatnot but you're aware that there's this whole other galaxy and so in in Edge of Empire it gives you the ability to tell those stories within a structure <laughs> So that there's, you know, still that that Star Warsy element. So, and I I like playing with the people I play with. So, that's a more personal thing. <laughs> I I think yeah, you can get kind of as involved or stay as uninvolved in the plot, the meta plot, yes. as you want to, which is always a cool thing. There are some right. games that you know it, it that kind of feels limiting. Star Wars is a big enough universe, galaxy, whatever that there's a lot of there's a lot of room to still tell those stories but have that kind of structure and interact with something that you a lot of people really really love yes and i've never been in a well maybe this is just the people i happen to play with but i've never done a romance plot i've never played a character who's who's been in a room i mean i think i once played a dragonborn with an estranged half-elf husband um (laughs) and she was a gambling addict and that's a whole other story but um i've never i've never played like a relationship growing like I have on Redemption and it's it it feels very in game it's still very immersive it's not something we're trying to like put on from the outside I don't know I feel like that's cool though because that's not the kind of story that you necessarily I mean there are romance stories in Star Wars but I think that that's not the first thing that you think of and so it's nice that it still feels like it fits well I I mean we're both we're not we're playing it I mean, we're both awkward about it, and we're both very good at awkward. <laughs> I don't know what you're uh, talking about. I'm 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 playing myself, <laughs> smooth as always. <laughs> uh, yeah, 
No, I actually yeah, yes, am about yes. as awkward as Isla in real life. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was talking with somebody and they were like, what's the best relationship you've ever had? And I was like, well, there's this guy named Tazi and they do not <laughs> listen to Redemption. <laughs> And you explain it like it's a real thing. Like, let me tell you. (laughs) I think another unique thing with this system is they did a really good job of building in mechanics that help GMs learn how to GM and help players learn how to be better players. Like in Edge of the Empire, you have obligation. Mm -hmm. Now, as a game master, I don't use obligation. It's a mechanic I just let go away. But that's because I've been GMing for a while and I know how to use the player's motivations and their character's goals to drive the story. If I was new to have this mechanic where I can roll a die at the beginning of the session and one of my player's obligations is going to come up, that just helps me build a story. It's a mechanic that's going to drive the story for me. So I think that's a really good addition to the system. I wish D&D or some other system that I started with had something like that because it really would have helped me when I started getting lost as to what to do. I mean, what kind of stuff does it have for players then to, that you feel like helps? The obligations helps are a big part of that. Because uh, if you can trigger their obligation, it's going to trigger them to role play. Okay. Especially if you can learn that two players have similar obligations and you can kind of play off of each other with them mm-hmm. and different stuff like that. Uh, or other opposite books, obligations. Yeah. Um, other books in the Fantasy Flight system, like The Force and Destiny, throws in morality. And morality is a big one. If you're a force user and you do something shady, you could take conflict points, which could lower your force rating, meaning you're moving more towards the dark side. Oh. And it doesn't I'd have like to. I'll, sorry, I'll, I'll add on top of Chris there, too. In fact, I just realized I interrupted you, Chris. So go ahead and finish what you were saying, and then I'll add on after. <laughs> um, what I was going to say is within that morality, it's not just when you use a force ability. So if you lie, you get a point of conflict. If you murder somebody, it's 10 points of conflict. And at the end of the session, you roll a D10, you subtract the number of conflict points you got in that session, and the result is whether you go up or down on that morality. So it can really affect a player's decisions on what they want to do. That's something that helps the players learn how to play a Jedi better. Now, morality is is something I don't use either because I like experienced players to make decisions and then face repercussions later. So I know if, you know, Mike, for example, wants to play a a force user and he's going to, you know, steal something, he knows that I'm going to throw that back at him later in game. Mm -hmm. I don't need a mechanic to do that. I just know how to do that as a game master. Mm -hmm. But for newer players, it's a good mechanic to teach them. It's nice to have that option available to, Mm -hmm. you know, I always always think that a lot of games, it's, um, I, I can kind of throw out what rules I don't want to use, but it's nice to have them there. I think that's always easier than having to add in your own rules because there isn't a way to do something that you want to do. Right. Yeah. Oh, for sure. There's also uh, motivations in this system is also a good way for new players to kind of build uh, relationships with the people in their group, as well as set up, uh, again, not just from an obligation standpoint, but set up some backstory pieces for them as well. Uh, the system comes with some some standard beginnings and backgrounds and things you can set for your character like outsider or a down and out background or uh, wrong place, wrong time. Um, yeah, and they give you some flavor or give you some ideas for building out your own stories. And I think depending on the game, many, many tabletop games don't necessarily impress upon you the importance of kind of building that story for your character – they give you a framework to start a game. Mm-hmm. Whereas I think Edge of the Empire, uh, you know, FFG has done a good job so far in making it so that when you're creating your character in this game, you're creating somebody in the Star Wars universe. Yes. Like that that lives and breathes and, and exists in that place. Yeah, it felt like when I was looking through it, at least, that it kind of gives you all of the tools to make a fully fleshed out person, like not a stat block, which yes. I think is... Um, more and more games are moving that way now. I think a lot of the, you know, when when it first role playing games first started, a lot of it was about stats and things like that, and they've become a lot more narrative. Um, and this does a nice mix of of both. I think absolutely, character yep. creation is easy to come onto with a concept and then just plug the mechanics in. Where other systems, you kind of have to fudge the mechanics of the system. This one, I 
I don't ever know a time we've ever had to fudge the mechanics to get a character to work. Nice. Yep. And a lot of times I find I can say, this is what I think I do. And there's mechanics to support it. And if I don't particularly know what it is, I'm lucky enough to be on a show with other people who do. Right. Or we fake it really well. <laughs> <laughs> we'll cut that part out so no one knows. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they know. <laughs> we don't hide it well. So before we jump into the full character creation part of this, um, we'll go into a little bit of background about the system um, and terms that we think people should know before we, um, before we start into stuff. The game was developed by Fantasy Flight and released in 2013. Uh, the rulebook that we are using, Edge of the Empire, focuses on smugglers and bounty hunters. It's generally about characters operating outside of the law, like we said. Um, there are also rulebooks for Age of Rebellion, where you play as rebels fighting against the Empire, and Force and Destiny, where you play as Jedi. And there are other Star Wars RPGs developed by Wizards of the Coast and West End Games. Um, we are not focusing on those in this episode. Maybe eventually we'll get to those. I know people have strong feelings about which systems are better and all that kind of stuff. I do want to talk a little bit about attributes and skills and kind of give people a quick rundown of what those are, what the differences are, um, if anybody has any thoughts on those. Uh, well, in this system, um, attributes are called characteristics. So you have your brawn, which is kind of a blend of your character's uh, strength and their overall toughness. Then you have agility, which everybody knows what agility is. Then you have intellect, how smart you are, uh, cunning, kind of like your wisdom. Uh, willpower, how much can you endure, and then presence. Presence is kind of like charisma. Now, all of your characteristics are going to affect your skills and your talent trees you take later. Um, all your skills are going to be based off a characteristic that's similar to it or that relates to it. So like athletics is based off of brawn, coordination is based off agility, uh, medicine is based off intellect, uh, that kind of stuff. And then the other thing I think that's different about this game, and we've talked a little bit about it so far, is talent trees. Um, can any, does anybody want to kind of explain how those work and what they are? I can, uh, I can touch on this one a little bit. Uh, I'll probably need Chris to fill in some of it because uh, he's the more mechanical of the three of us probably. Mm -hmm. uh, if, you're, uh, if, if you are anybody who plays video games or a gamer that's played any kind of role-playing game in the last like 10 years – <laughs> Talent trees are something you're very familiar with in the terms of the way a game works, right? You get your experience points and then you can spend those experience points to build out uh, talents that affect your ability to do things in the game. Uh, for example, a talent tree might be uh, for the technician class, uh, they might be a mechanic. And then if you look at the mechanic talent tree, there's going to be a lot of different talents that directly affect your ability to roll dice, uh, penalties you might take to rolls for skills you might try to use, uh, benefits that you might get from having that particular talent. So, for example, a, taking a particular talent might give you an additional uh, blue or a success die that you could roll um, in, the, in the midst of making that check to help you succeed. Uh, it may take away a negative die or a black die that would cause you, uh, that could possibly cause you an additional, uh, complication or a failure. Um, that's basically the way the talent trees work. And you build those up again, based on the experience you earn as you play. Every character gets a starting experience pool based on their race and some other things that you choose in the character creation process. And then you'll spend that XP to upgrade your, uh, core abilities you can use it to buy skills, and then you'll also use that on your talent tree to kind of work your way down the tree and get in, into some things that you might find appealing for your character. Yeah. There's no levels in this system. It's just mm -hmm. earned XP is what you use to build your character. So your starting wounds, which is uh, how much damage you can take, which is based on your species combined with your brawn, the only way that can increase later is either taking talent trees or through cybernetics. So your wounds or hit points don't increase as you go up unless you do something mechanically or story-driven to do it. So that's a little different than other systems. 
I like it because it allows you to be a little more free with what your characters are going to do and how they grow. I'm the game master that says when you spend that XP, it's going to be on something you've done in the story. Mm -hmm. So, for example, Tazi, who starts off as a character as a great pilot, hasn't really increased a lot of the piloting stuff because we don't end up doing a lot of piloting. He's become a hell of a gunner, though. Mm -hmm. He shoots two yeah, pistols really well. So it's what you want to get out of the game. And that's just how we run it. Something else to note, especially when you're talking about like the brawn and your hit points, Edge of the Empire is a game in which it is difficult for a PC to die. As we've discovered. As we've <laughs> discovered. Um, not that anybody here are... has tried to kill another PC. No, 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 no nobody. Never, nobody here. Never. never. <laughs> The system is set up so that, you know, you are playing as the hero characters, and the hero characters, unless there is some kind of story-driven narrative piece or, you know, somebody rolls extremely poorly a number of times in a row, uh, there's a, it's very difficult to kill or outright die as a PC. You'll take wound levels, you'll be, you'll be incapacitated for, for a, a long time, uh, it could take you time to heal up. You know, we've had characters in back to tanks for weeks. Yeah, um, that was fun. <laughs> but at the end of the day, you know, this system is basically meant to be a storytelling system, much like Star Wars. And in Star Wars, it's rare that you see a main character bite the dust. Yeah, I think Luke Skywalker out in, you know, Hoth survived all that horrible, frigid time and spent all that time battling monsters, and he still lived. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, General. Leia getting busted out of a starship <laughs> and then making her Shot way into back. deep space. Yeah, yeah. And mm -hmm. going, hmm, nope. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, I, I like that it's it's pretty clear that you are playing as the protagonists of this story that you're telling. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think the system is set up to uh, to make that happen and to give you the best experience while doing that. Um, which is, you know, kind of what I think you want out of Star Wars. You want to play those, like, big characters. They're not, you know, there's there's nothing subtle about the main characters in a Star Wars movie or in the books or anything like that. So, But it's funny to speak to that, too, because when you think about, like, when I think about, like, the first time I played this game, my the point of playing this game is I wanted to be, like, kind of the everyday guy. Mm -hmm. Like, I wanted to, you, who is in everyday dangerous situations or or even like things that might be a little out of the norm for a regular person like you know didn't necessarily need to be like the guy saving the galaxy but maybe saving a couple people like from a slaver ship you know yeah the small scale uh and it's amazing how quickly that ends up becoming big scale yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> But at the same time, you know that that fun is still there. You, you still get that Star Wars feel. You still get the 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 excitement of being getting to play kind of that hero character with the ups and the downs. Uh, uh, the dice system certainly makes it possible to have some spectacular failures as well as some amazing successes. So, oh, definitely, yeah, because it's all narrative driven, and you could go as epic as you want with the right GM, or you could be as mundane as you want with the raid gm yep that's very cool all right well anything else you guys want to add i no i think we've pretty much hit the system pretty well wonderful oh uh, well with that said hey let's make some people woohoo let's, let's make some people well, who wants to go first well let's see um i think ryan should go first he's been pretty quiet through this whole thing i have been because you guys are excellent speakers oh, thank you so i think we we according to the book yeah. Step one is to start with the backgrounds. That felt weird to me looking through it because I was like, I don't know. I, usually I kind of I like to have an idea of sort of the person that I want to embody. But it just knowing their backstory right away felt really bizarre to me. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's probably benefits to that. I don't. Do you guys usually start there nope. when you make a character for this or do you do that last? <laughs> <laughs> I do it last usually. Generally, I come up with the concept I want. Then I plug everything in, and then I kind of add in the background and the backstory. But I kind of do that as I'm building the character, too. Mm -hmm. uh, usually yeah, I, I just... I want to point out that it doesn't seem to have any mechanical benefit or... No. You know, like, change anything mechanically when you're building the character. But I, I did want to at least say that, according to the book, this is where we should start. 
Yeah. I don't think it's where we're actually going to start. But, right. you know, take it yeah. for what it's worth, listening audience. I think, I think if you're coming into the game without an idea, I think a background is a good place to start. Yeah. Because it gives you that – it literally gives you that foundation for whatever you're going to make out of your character. Whatever race you choose – or excuse me, race or species. Uh, they do call it species in the game, so I'll call it species. <laughs> um Whatever species you choose to play, whatever specializations you take, like you're building that, you're getting that base, that that foundation layer with that background piece. So, I mean, I, I think there's something there, but most people with experience in playing these types of games are going to come in with a concept in mind. Yeah. Yeah. Even yeah, a vague one. That's that's kind of what I do. Even like a three-word concept. I know, right? Maybe. <laughs> hey, those type of concepts are, are usually things that turn into really great characters, so... Yep, absolutely. All right, so Ryan, yes. what is your concept? All right, well, I can't really go into making my first ever Star Wars ever character and not do something that I've always wanted to do. That's fair. So I started them off thinking I wanted to be kind of a uh, like a, a medic type person with uh, some force sensitivity. Okay, excellent. Which I know it makes it a little bit more complex than a no normal character, but yeah, I think I, I think I figured out how to do that while I was prepping for the podcast. Yep, uh, you'll just end up taking Force Exile yes. as your probably your career, and then we just put points into medicine, which shows that you've been trained as a medic. Now, can you start as Force Exile, or do you have to start as a different one and then buy into Force Exile? Let me double check. Because I, I was going through the book, and as I was reading, it said you have to do, take one of these, and if you want to get something else, then you have to buy into it, and Force Exile was in the something else. I believe you are correct. I think, I believe with Edge of the Empire, they meant it to be a buy, because Edge of the Empire, as a setting, is really more about the non-force sensitive characters. Yes. So they they included the force exile background for someone to make a force sensitive but not necessarily make that their beginning character. The you know the time frame in which the game takes place is mostly you know post it, it's around the time of Rogue One, right? Where uh Rogue One and and New Hope where the force sensitives the Jedi are almost extinct. Mm -hmm. You know, they are if people know about them, it's myths and legends. You know, nobody remembers the only 30 years ago they were plentiful. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, in 30 years, they were reduced to legends. Well, and that just speaks to the power of the empire. It's not just military force. The amount of propaganda that's out there and the amount of, of I can't think of a better term other than cultural brainwashing. Mm -hmm. I mean, they basically rewritten history. As the winners often do. Yeah. Yes, as the winners almost always do. Um, and so, yeah, something that was commonplace 30 years ago becomes myth and legend. Kind of like... And you're not supposed to be trained and, right. you know, because yeah. you're, you're supposed to be sort of living on the outskirts of society. Mm -hmm. And, um, y you know, it, it would be incredibly unsafe to, <laughs> to try and train anybody, even if you mm -hmm. had the knowledge to do so. Yep. You should just go hide in a cave. Yeah. I think the the impetus for that also is the that it gives you as a character a place to build to. If you want to make your character force sensitive, then through play you can you know take your character to that place where they are force sensitive. Like they discover these small things. It, it gives you another piece to play with in the puzzle instead of starting as a character that can already sense the force and right. you know you do all these things. Yeah, and I think the reason why I chose human for my species uh, is because they get that little bit of an experience boost at the beginning. And that allowed me to spend a little bit more points getting that force exile uh, secondary career. So that's, that's where, that's what I started with. So you started, so you started your character as a, as a, as a medic. So what's the actual specialization that you took to get the medic? Or I should say, I should, I should say the career, the career path, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, career path. That would be colonist. And then that went, that to, went doctor. to doctor. Yep. Got it. And then um, that was my starting career and specialization. 
And then from there, I was able to uh, buy into the Force Exile specialization. Got it. Yes. Which that goes back to what Chris was talking about, too, with the fact that, you know, you can start like as your character that like you can start as a technician uh, for myself, like a technician slicer. And then when we decide that we're going to spend our XP, maybe I've done something adventure that would lead me to, you know, a bounty hunter tree and you can just purchase into that tree and then I'll take your character down a, a side path or a different path. Mm -hmm. And you're not limited by a class per se. Yeah. And I know we haven't talked too much about uh, XP pools and spending XP to buy things, but I, I think we'll get into that in a little bit uh, once everybody gets through uh, what they're choosing. So if you're out there, listeners, and you're lost as I was when I first looked at this game, <laughs> uh, don't worry, we'll get there. Absolutely. All right, who's next? I vote Emily. Oh, okay. And her three-word concepts. Uh, so my three-word concept... Uh, is decommissioned assassin droid. Nice. Ooh, so good. Thank you. And so I've been looking through the book as people have been talking. And assassin droid is is one of the essentially sub races or subspecies of droid. Uh, and so there's, you know, nice, nice fun stuff about that, about the what's added to, you know, you kind of get some extra special abilities and whatnot. And there's Hopefully enough, there's an assassin talent tree, mm -hmm. which I think yes, will, will help. Is. And I think the idea of being decommissioned assassin droid means um, that the idea being like I could fit in with any group because a decommissioned droid, you know, the question is, what do you do? Are you out just for that bounty? Have you fallen in with this group of other people who have loyalties? And so the, an idea of someone who's sort of on that 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 down and out and kind of searching for what what they're doing and then of course with the droid you get to you get to pull in the they have programming but if they're decommissioned they're not being upgraded yeah. so it's kind of like you know if you have an old phone once it stops being upgraded you have to start getting creative about what you do mm -hmm. to keep it working very cool <laughs> so would you still take the assassin tree then if you are, y yes, I think how, so. How, do you, how would you advance that? Because if you're not really being upgraded, I'm just curious because right. I feel like there are fun ways that you could. Well, it would mess around it would with that. Depend on my relationship with the rest of the team, mm -hmm. I think, because a, a droid can easily go into, as we've seen, um, gadgeteering or any any number of other things, becoming a, a slicer, becoming an explorer. So it to me, I I'm not in. Or even um, more of the, sorry, I'm just kind of flipping through. Like, what else could they become? Bodyguard makes a lot of sense. Like, smuggler. Like, Ooh, that would be a good one. A bodyguard yeah. would be really good. Being a decommissioned assassin droid, I feel like, just gives a lot of room within the story to kind of bond with the, the group or not. <laughs> or not. Yeah. Or not. you are an assassin droid. <laughs> well, previous and that might assassin be fun. droid. I'm sorry? Previously an assassin droid. Previously, yes. Decommissioned. Yeah. I don't, yes. I don't want to bond with anything that right. ever was an assassin droid. <laughs> you can't well, choose and, what you were. And you as just some, can as choose I didn't know, going. I didn't know what else other people were choosing. I wanted to give myself wiggle room in case other people had really strong ideas. I could, as a player, slip into some other niches. That was, mm -hmm. that's something I think about. I'm, you know, even if I'm going to play a fighter, okay, I'm, I might leave some wiggle room like maybe because i'm a droid i you know maybe scholar's not the right word but maybe i have some points in that tree mm -hmm. because i'm bored and i'm constantly doing research if there's nobody else with that sort of talent sorry i, I, I cut my is. teeth on 4e D D, yeah. and so yeah. i'm thinking about those sort of classi well, classifications and and roles a lot I, i'm already thinking of uh potential background hooks with your character so um, hey, I think, that's I think awesome. we're good there. Well, and to be honest with you, the concept I had already come up with ties in perfect because I was thinking of doing a, a droid who previously was a um, an officer within the droid army during the Clone Wars. Ooh. Ooh. So he's we're one of the so like, many droids. <laughs> <laughs> he was like a captain type droid that just commanded little groups of uh, troops. So 
you could have been an assassin droid that worked with him or under him. Oh, yeah. And if there's backstory and there's maybe there's tension, maybe they have the, you know, the same rank, but in different areas. So they were technically called something different, but they, neither of them outranked each other. So there's a constant tension about whose orders do you follow or do you give the orders? <laughs> Absolutely. So we can't all be droids except for me because I need somebody to do my medicine on. <laughs> that is a fair point. <laughs> Well, so we have to cross our fingers then and hope that Michael is not planning on making a droid, because I totally was. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> what do we got? What's going on, I Michael? I could change mine to not a droid. I could just be a decommissioned assassin. Oh, no. Let's uh, let's. No, because we don't actually have to play these characters, yeah. so don't worry about let's it. Let's roll with whatever we got and use <laughs> our sorry. creative mind. It's mind. hard for me to get my head around. Yeah, I I know it's it's a little bit uh, a little bit awkward sometimes. But but we love um, it. Right, Michael, Mike. what are you what are you putting together here? So uh, I came up with a uh, a slicer. Um, Good. And uh, it's a protocol droid. <laughs> 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 now, see, I went into this since we, again, just so everyone <laughs> understands, we clearly did not talk about what we were making before we did <laughs> no. this. this is so but this good. is why no, it's it makes fantastic. Me so happy! I love I, it. I made the assumption. Uh, co- very wrongly that Chris would choose to not play a droid because he plays a droid in our show yeah. at, all the time. Well, play, play what you know. I do not know Chris as well as I thought. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, but no, I I, I picked a uh, a loam protocol droid, and the loam droids are the insectoid looking protocol droids. They've oh, got kind yeah. of like the bug eyes or oh. like the the fly looking eyes. Um, I. Chose those droids because they were listed as being like uh, the best. The way to put it is the manufacturer was stopped because they they continued to have personality issues. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I have a concept of a a protocol droid slicer that basically was purchased used by a data merchant uh, and was kind of outfitted to be a mobile data slicing and data exchange unit mm. uh, that he hires out to groups that need that type of expertise. Very cool. Uh, I actually just thought of why a bunch of droids might have a medic around. Mm-hmm. And please, please. For all the people that you assassinate? For all the people, yes. Well, and so uh, please, please forgive me for pulling in a different, um, uh, a different non-Star Wars thing. So you know how in Firefly? <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Like the reason they have a companion is because like spaceports don't necessarily let you in without a good companion. Like, <laughs> you know, we're all droids. Like, what's going to get us in places that we shouldn't be or we should be? Like, we've got a human medic on board. Yeah. Well, they certainly won't let us into that cantina in Mos Eisley. I know, right? That's that's very true. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Very nice, Amelia. That was I'm gonna give. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. That's what I'm here for. Um, I want to play a protocol droid. <laughs> um, I I want to do the uh, the scholar. Nice. Oh, fancy background. So I picked something that was like higher intelligence and not very much brawn, and um, mostly I'm around for talking to people that the decommissioned assassin droid can't can't talk to. Our assassin droid doesn't know how to talk to people. <laughs> this is actually fabulous. Like, we have people who can, like, manipulate your brain. And if you won't give us the information, I'm going to break your kneecaps. And if you still won't give us the information, the medic's going to fix them. And then somebody else is going <laughs> to break something else. Like, I love it. Are we the robot mafia? <laughs> we are the robot mafia. Droid. Droid mafia. Droid, droid mafia. Droid mafia. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm going to give him the Droids. clamps. <laughs> the clamps or clamp like objects. <laughs> uh, so I this is a uh, quite the quite the team here. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I'm pretty excited oh my about goodness! This. <laughs> I love our human, our one human man. <laughs> uh, it, it's funny because I took uh, I took some interesting uh, force abilities, and, <laughs> and uh, none of us can feel the force. Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> And, and that's probably one of the reasons why I'm around this whole crew is because, you know, I'm totally not um, fully disciplined in use of the force. 
So I don't have to worry about accidentally reading my crew's minds while <laughs> I'm uh, while I'm just chilling out on the ship. Well, and the other thought is, right now anybody who's force sensitive is being hunted down. Yeah. Where's a better place for a force sensitive to hide than on a crew full of crazy droids? Yeah, that's true. Oh. <laughs> so we're like your smoke screen. I'm just the medic. You let us do all that. Yeah. We are You're your the- droid beard. <laughs> Droid beard. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Maybe you pretend to be a mechanic. Oh, yeah. I could probably fake that. Well, not for long with this many droids. I guess. I guess. <laughs> well, no, I mean to outsiders. Yeah. Okay, I was going to say, until one of our arms falls <laughs> off and then nothing works and then we're in trouble. That's amazing. Interesting. All right, so. All right. I'm going to have to write down our designations as we make them up because I'm yeah. going <laughs> to get real confused real fast. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we've got our character concepts going here. Uh, so what is the, what's the next step that we need to do to start fleshing out these characters mechanically? Well, normally you pick your species, but we've all pretty much done that. Yep. And actually, uh, I think first we technically are supposed to do obligations, if we want to. If you want to. Yeah, yeah I that's guess true. if we're, to, I mean, no, like, if we're eh. going along with the book, I think that's probably wise. That's what people are going to be looking at yeah. first, so we'll all follow right. that order. Uh, D100s, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. Ooh. Addiction. Oh. How is that droid supposed to be addicted to? I don't know. <laughs> uh, you know, uh... Killing. Could be addicted to killing. Oh. Murder. Be... <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not feeling good with that one. <laughs> you know, the we, uh, we did... Murder. We had a droid that had an addiction to a... Basically, uh... An enhancement unit, or like a uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> so oh, that's true. It, where or worse comes to worse, I guess you could call it like an overdrive, or like a, you know a, an overthreaded processor or overclocked processor. Yeah, or just constantly upgrading parts. You have this like or, weird need to constantly or gambling, maybe. Ooh. Yeah, you know we don't know any droids <laughs> that do that. Yeah, <laughs> I hear that's a good source of income. You could be addicted to in- improving yourself. Looking for right. the next bigger, badder weapon. That's true. Yeah. Uh, or uh, even addicted to uh, a certain kind of oil that, like, I think it makes me run better because I'm an old droid, but maybe it's got some sort of, like, something in it that makes me, uh, well, no, I'm a droid. We could be addicted to, like, oil baths or something like that, and it's just you, you really want to get an oil bath as soon as you get back on the ship or, or something, right. I guess. I mean, an addiction doesn't have to play out. It can play out mechanically or in story however you yeah. want it to. So. Right. And as an obligation, it just means that it's something that can hook into right. the story somehow instead of something that, yeah. you know, you constantly have to try to right. find a fix for. I do like the idea of being addicted to upgrading myself. Okay. As someone who's decommissioned. Very cool. Yeah, I feel like that's a good fit. Yeah. I have to take care of myself because nobody else will. Right. Well, except for the whole crew that we got here, but... But can we trust each other? Oh. No. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) So, Ryan, what did you get for yours? I got Betrayal for mine. Um, And kind of what I was thinking is, uh, since my character background was from a, like, a middle class sort of background, I think that's what I chose. Let me see. Yeah, so middle class. Um, I kind of uh, decided that I came from a family that was, you know, effectively barely making ends meet. And I had... Ironically, very middle class in the empire. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I had kind of a higher calling that that took me off world. And my family feels like I basically betrayed them um, and the community as a whole. And they kind of uh, want me back because of my my skill set with my my uh, medicine. You know, medics are kind of hard to come by where I come from, as well as my my special abilities that some of them have come to rely on a little bit. Mm-hmm. I like it. I feel like yes. that fits really well. Yeah, boy, I can just hear like a uh, uh, someone in your family guilt tripping you. Oh yeah, hardcore. Well, I, r- I rolled randomly and got responsibility. Nope. So I think since he was a 
captain in the Clone Wars, and obviously the droids didn't survive, that now he has a stronger responsibility to keep the current crew together and alive. Oh, I like that. That's really good. I like it. Mike, what'd you get? I chose Duty Bound. The background for the character is that um, the beginnings and reason for adventure were a little bit sticky for this because it's a droid. Yep. So I decided to kind of go with the general story, which was that the droid was purchased by the data courier used as you know a mobile data courier and slicing unit. So the duty bound background or the duty bound obligation comes from the fact that like the character feels a feels a a, a duty to this per, this individual that's basically refitted them or like made them useful again and relies on them to complete the tasks associated to Hmm. them. So I took that as the the obligation. Okay. Very cool. Amelia, what was your obligation? So I, when I did it randomly, I got debt, which I just was not feeling really. Um, And the more I think about it as we're kind of building the story, the more I think that I want to take blackmail. Oh. I think this protocol droid has some information that people want and i'm trying to figure out exactly what that information would be or how this works but i think my job as scholar is to know things Mm -hmm. and so you haven't been wiped in a while so you've you've got some secrets that uh people do not want out in the world Mm -hmm. yeah that's a pretty heavy obligation what if she knows vader's true identity (gasps) (gasps) oh my gosh that's so good (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's fantastic. All right. Yeah, so I think that's what I'm going to pick. Very cool. So, yeah, we have a group of five players, and the the book says that we should be starting our obligations at a point value of 10. Um, and I know obligations, there's a mechanic at the beginning of every session, if you choose to use it, um, to roll a D100 um, and if you roll, what is it, below the total party obligation value, then something comes into play. Is that right? I'll say yes, but I don't have my book in front okay. of me. I think, I mean, that I think that's good. what I'm looking at. So I know that there's also in character creation for this system, you can add five or ten obligation points to your total and gain extra starting experience or extra starting credits as well. So if you make your obligation heavier and something that'll be more uh, detrimental to the crew, basically, it sounds like you can actually start with a little bit more of a bonus to make your uh, character a little better to start with. Yep. I usually encourage people to take the experience points up front. Yeah. Unless there's something they're dying to, you know, have a piece of gear they have to have. Right. Right. Because you only start with like 500 credits, which isn't a lot. No. I No, it is not. I contemplated doing a 5 XP bonus and a 1,000 credit bonus split, mm-hmm. but I opted for starting with 10 extra experience points in the EXP pool. Yeah, and that, to me, fits more the theme of Edge of Empire, because you're supposed to be kind of down now. Yeah. Right. And based on the crazy droids here, we're, we're probably not... Uh, not the luckiest crew. No. No. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. I think we're doing fine. Exactly. So the next step would be um, selecting a species, which we've all kind of done already. Um, yep. yep. And we've got our career and our specializations. Well, let's let's talk about the careers a yeah. bit uh, for, again, you know, for those people kind of getting into the game. Oh, yeah. Because the way the careers are set up, the careers kind of direct you to the talent trees, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and each career has a number of specializations you can go into. Yes. For instance, I'm taking the career of a uh, colonist mm-hmm. with the specialization of politico. Okay. So as a colonist, I get to choose six skills from the list of Charm, core worlds, deception, education, leadership, lore, negotiation, or streetwise. What that does is that gives me a free rank in training in those skills that I choose. So I chose core worlds, education, leadership, lore, negotiation, and streetwise. Okay. Then under the specialization of Politico, you get to choose three from the list of 
charm, coercion, core worlds, and deception. So he took charm, coercion, and deception. Okay. And and for skills, the, when you're picking those career skills, also keep in mind that your character's intelligence score will also modify how many of those you get to pick at the start. Yes. So, for example, my intelligence score on my my technician slicer is a little bit higher than the standard. My intelligence is three, so I got to pick two extra skills. So, instead of four, I got to pick six. Oh, interesting. And for the specialization skills, I got to pick three instead of two. Oh, very nice. Okay. So, the different career options that the, the book gives you um, are bounty hunter, colonist, explorer, hired gun, smuggler or technician Mm -hmm. and then within each of those there's what is it like three typically three Mm -hmm. yeah um and so it kind of just keeps further breaking down from there um it sounds like oh um emily it sounds like you picked something other than colonist yes i was going with bounty hunter assassin Okay. So the um the bounty hunter is broken down into three: a survivalist, gadgeteer, and assassin. And I thought decommissioned assassin droid should probably know something about assassining, <laughs> assassinating. <laughs> yes. So and so I also picked colonist, and then for my specialization, I went with scholar. Nice. Yeah, and I also chose colonist, and my specialization was doctor. So we actually covered all of the colonist specializations, which is interesting. <laughs> and Stay again, I, for another episode where we pick something other than colonist droids. Yep. And I went with technician, and the the specializations there are mechanic, uh, slicer, and then I think there's also a outlaw tech, which is basically someone who creates or modifies existing technology to make things more powerful. You know, customize weapons, customize gear, that type of right. thing. Oh, cool. Uh, uh, one of the other things I was considering because of my addiction to upgrading was putting some points into – so ex- the Explorer career has a talent tree called Trader, as in like I Ooh. I trade materials, not as in I'm, I'm actually fighting for the enemy. I'm a sleeper Sith agent. <laughs> not that anybody here would ever play that. Uh, so th- you know, outlaw tech might fit you better if you're doing modifications to yourself. Oh, that's true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, outlaw tech. I always think Boba Fett. He wasn't would be an outlaw tech. That's Ooh. that's awesome. Yeah. So there's any number of ways we could go, and I will decide before we record later. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Outlaw. There it so- is under technician. I see. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I, I think all of them have kind of cool option, and and some of them have some crossover um, within the trees too of of skills that there are skills that appear in more than one tree. So yeah. yes, you, you can, can definitely stack some things up and and yeah. create a backstory mm-hmm. through them. Definitely. Oh, nice. There's a talent tree with smuggler just called thief. <laughs> There's a scoundrel, and then a pilot. I'm going to look at Scoundrel, because I really like that idea, maybe for another character at some point. Oh, that's awesome. All right. Um, So now that we have our career and specializations picked, we can invest our experience points. And Correct. This is what I was talking about earlier. We, we each start with a, a pool of experience based on our species, right? Correct. Mm-hmm. Yep. And then you can choose to gain up to 10 more if you up your obligation. So as a human, I started with 120 experience points. And Droid started with 175, yep. I think. 175. Yes. And that's a game balance mechanic because the characteristics for droids all start at ones. Oh. And humans, I believe they all start at twos. Yeah. So droids have to spend more when you build them in your initial characteristics to kind of even it out right that makes a lot of sense because i I heard 175 i'm like holy cow yeah we're gonna be so much better than you i know seriously i'm surprised actually that so many of us picked droids because i looking through because all of those characteristics start at one i thought "Mm, i don't know if i really want to do this because like it feels like you're starting from behind a little bit um it i mean it does seem to balance out as you build them, though. Yeah, I didn't think that far into building. 
<laughs> I was just like, I want to play a freaking decommission. So I increased my, Assassin's my intellect. Yeah. And my, I increased my intellect and my willpower to three, and then cunning, agility, and brawn to two, and I left my presence at one. <laughs> That'll work. That's an amazing uh, protocol droid. Oh, gosh, I can't stand you, but you're so useful. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like that sounds like it. Yeah, yeah. pretty much. I'm not saying I was a good protocol droid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Transdotions start with 90 XP. That's the lowest I'm seeing right now. So, it, yeah, yeah, it really does vary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, the species also give you other... Yeah. Uh, atru- not attributes. Uh, the species also gives you other abilities. Like, for a droid... We actually get to train in two additional career skills yep. and one specialist skills. Droids, we don't have to eat, sleep, drink. Uh, we're not affected by toxins. Mm-hmm. But we don't benefit from like Bacta or stim packs or medicine checks. Yep. You have to use a mechanics check to repair us. Okay. Um, droids can't become force sensitive at all. And we do have a cybernetic cap of six, which I think is about the same as everybody else. But they did a really good job of balancing out the starting XP and your species bonuses. Okay. Yeah. A bunch of people spent a really long time thinking about this. Yeah. It's, and, yeah, and, it's, it's well thought out. Yeah. <laughs> and probably just creating character after character after character. We should have them on our show. <laughs> <laughs> you could try. I don't know. <laughs> if or you Can could have a lovable cast of misfits from Redemption. Yes. <laughs> Awesome. Is lovable the right word? Uh, You're sure. not not lovable. <laughs> and Michael is very satisfied to be here. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I am very satisfied. That's interesting. I actually, when I chose human, I get to choose two non-career skills uh, that I start with, uh, I think, one rank in, if, that's, if I understand that correctly. And mm-hmm. yes. originally, I had chosen discipline and survival, but... I think I'm going to change survival to uh, mechanic. That's probably a probably good wise. Yeah. That would make a lot of sense. <laughs> Everyone, this is why you should have a session zero and build characters as a group. Yeah. Yeah, or at least session. heavily discuss it. Yeah. Because my, my thought was, man, I'm going to be so useful to the crew. I'm going to be able to find supplies and, and cool <laughs> stuff on planets and and be able to like forage for goods and... And food. He's a medic and he can forage for food. He's in a group of droids. <laughs> <laughs> well, on the plus side, that means he never goes hungry. One of these well, things is not me. like the other. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I also love it because so often in like sci-fi or in fantasy, you have sort of the the non-human trying to figure out what it, you know, what are these humans? You oh, know, yeah. the, the idea that humanity is is new and 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 different and curious and so i really like the idea of like there being a single human <laughs> turning that on and everybody head else a is bit. a droid yeah we are we are all data in this yeah. situation except some of us do not care about why humans feel the way they do <laughs> i was gonna say some of us are more like lore than data yeah. that's true <laughs> definitely just wonder what this will do to my psyche oh yeah not you might get no. really um just <laughs> You're going to start word? to general grievous yourself. The escape yeah. pod? <laughs> Just like, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Your stomach's torn you're open gonna, and you're dead. You're going to become a Don't medic that it. starts to replace himself with cybernetic pieces. Pretty much. Yeah. Ooh. To fit in. Oh, man. I just want to be like my friends. <laughs> mm. Peer pressure is a B. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and we won't even think of it as peer pressure. It's just like, of course, we're superior. Just gonna be called meat bag every day. <laughs> meat puppet is my yeah. preferred term. <laughs> meat puppet. Yep. Oh. Accompany us to the dock, meat bag. <laughs> <laughs> oh my Response god! Response positive. You're like our pet. <laughs> oh, it's so good. Uh, I'm just trying to survive. My goodness, what I have to do to survive? Yeah, finding out how you ended up on this ship is gonna be real interesting. Uh huh. I, I had a I had an idea if there was just one droid or maybe two, but uh, four yeah. is my my brain starting to hurt a little bit. But if we were actually going to play, that would be a great place to start. Actually, yeah. I can't wait for the scene where you start looking through the cabinets on the ship and realize there are no dishes or anything mm-hmm. even. 
It's going to be great. Yeah, once we get to the point where we're choosing our ship, uh, it's going to be really interesting to figure out who owns the ship first. Was it my ship? Was it your ship? Was it... Who's 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 joining whose crew here, basically? I... See, I have an idea for that, too, and I don't want to spoil it. All right. So let's... We, uh... we will get there when we get there. Yes. Awesome. So I when we were talking to Kendall, who couldn't be here, unfortunately, um, he mentioned that you can, when you're spending points on your characteristics, that like two is about average, or is that like three I'd is- say that's about okay. fair. I think two is a good average mm. for okay. most characters. And then uh, three is pretty good, and anything above that's just kind of excessive, or? <laughs> or is that Chris? like the thing that you're really good at? Chris? If you really want a, a character that's got one sole focus, then going above a three is a good thing. Yeah. Like, for example, the character that I'm building, I'm going to up his presence to four, which costs me a lot of experience points because it's each time you increase a characteristic, you have to spend 10 times the new number. So to go from one to two, I have to spend 20 experience points. Then to go up to a three is another 30 experience points. So I'm spending a lot of my starting experience points there. Yeah. His brawn's not good. His agility's not good. His cunning is still a one. I'm only putting points into intellect and willpower on top of that. So he's going to be really good at leadership type things and talking, but not so good at anything else. To start off with. Yep. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and then for myself, uh, since I also went into the, the Force Exile uh, specialization, I decided to put an extra point into willpower, since I've, I've got two for everything else, and then a three for willpower right now. All right. And then, Emily, where did you spend your your points? I haven't spent my points yet. Okay. We'll come back to you. <laughs> well, I took... I left my brawn and agility as ones. I took my intellect up to a three because it's pretty useful for computers and slicing. And then I took twos across the board for cunning, willpower, and presence because as a protocol droid, I feel like the droid would still have a knowledge of how to interact with meat bags <laughs> <laughs> and possibly, you know, and use those skills to be deceptive instead of helpful. That mm -hmm. yeah, makes sense. Well, just from what everybody else is saying, it sounds like um, I need to be able to hit things. <laughs> so I'm <laughs> Michael's just like nodding his head like really hard. Yeah, it sounds like I might be able to. Accurate. Yeah. Well, you're the, you're uh, the if only you could combat. be shooty punchy, we'd really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, shooty punchy, got it. So I'm probably okay with a ranged weapon, but I didn't put any points into any skills for any of that. It's just being a human, you start up with two agility, you're fine enough. Yeah. You have access to the all those skills, yeah. so you can use any kind of gun. You're just going to roll two green dice to start with. Right. You just don't have any training to upgrade a die. Right, exactly. Which probably means, what I just said probably means very little to anybody who <laughs> hasn't played the system, but we'll explain the dice <laughs> yeah. later. Do we want to go into specializations? So, okay, I'm, I need to ask a stupid question. Do it. So the starting <laughs> experience for droids, 175 XP, is that... Mm -hmm. Is that XP only for to go into the the abilities? It's for nope, everything. That's across the board. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah, that's why I was hesitant to name my my abilities. I initially did two upgrades, uh, one for willpower and one for I believe intelligence. But then I couldn't do hardly anything else because that's sixty XP right off the bat. Yep, and I kind of want some uh, some talents. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't do a lot for talents because I figured I could add those later and they're not super expensive. Absolutely. Starting, I usually encourage people put a little more into characteristics because after initial character creation, the only way you can increase characteristics is either by completing a, a talent tree. Ooh, that's hard. Or through cybernetics. So you cannot spend experience points later to increase characteristics. So put a little more into them now and then worry about your talent trees and your skills later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For example, for my Politico, it's 20, 70, 85, 85, 
it would cost me 100 earned XP to increase a characteristic through the skill tree. Or I'm sorry, through the talent tree. You generally earn five experience points per game session, which they break down to about a two hour block. So you're looking at 20 game sessions before you can increase a characteristic. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that's why I say, you know, put it in now, take a few less, you know, talents to begin with and a few less skills. That'll pay off in the long run as you're building your character. Hmm. It's good to know. Are we ready to jump into the talent trees? I think so. Okay. Mine's pretty easy. Uh, he's only got three. I took uh, Kill with Kindness. Uh, that allows me to remove a setback die um, for charm and leadership checks. And setback dice are situational or environmental things that make the, the challenge roll a little more difficult. That's so, the black die, correct, Chris? Yes. So, for people that only know this game through podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> well, what you gonna Fair do? Enough. Yeah. Like, for example, with my guy, if I'm trying to do a leadership check in the middle of a firefight, there's probably going to be some black dice because he's going to also be worrying about not getting shot. Um, from, from there, from Kill with Kindness, I took Inspiring Rhetoric. Uh, I can make an average leadership check, and if I succeed, for every success, one ally within close range can recover strain, which is like your mental and, phys- or mental and emotional damage. And every advantage I roll, I can have one other ally recover strain. Ooh, that's really cool. nice. And then the other one I took was Plausible Deniability. <laughs> I can remove a setback dice from coercion and deception checks. So I'm going to be good at lying and helping people stay uh, emotionally and mentally strong, but uh, don't ask him to shoot <laughs> or fight. And I'm the opposite. <laughs> well, tell what us you how pick? you're the opposite. <laughs> well, because I'm still kind of playing with my um, attributes, I'm, I'm looking at the talent tree to try and figure out how many points I want to spend here. Um, and definitely if I'm thinking... I need to be punchy shooty. Dodge and quick draw look uh, like really good things to start off with. Particularly, I'm thinking okay. quick draw, but I have to have dodge to have quick draw. But that's quick draw is great. Yeah, that's 15 points, which is a lot to invest, I think, but probably worth it. it. Yeah, probably. And for those that don't know the system well, quick draw allows you to draw a weapon as an incidental action, which means it doesn't take. Uh, your action or maneuver during combat. So in other game system, it would be a free action to pull your weapon out. Which is really helpful if you're ambushed or in a quick firefight or... Can you just upgrade so your arm is a gun? Yes, eventually, I think. (laughs) I'm actually not sure how to do that mechanically. I don't know either. I was just thinking about that. Like, is it always drawn then? There's. But then do they let you in places? There's probably black dice then to, you know, interact with anyone when your arm is a gun. <laughs> yeah, I just have to, you just, you just keep me outside. See? You all go into a bar. I just hang out outside. Um, I've had somebody make a character up for a, a one shot and they wanted to do that with the droid. I just basically said, yep, you can put it in your arm, but your maneuver is to open up the port to actually fire. Right. So your hand, you have to hold your hand up and open up the port so the gun can shoot. That so makes sense. It's just you a flavor thing. You would out all the time. It would get sand and stuff yeah. in it. Yeah. I hate sand. That's just science. So Mike, Mike, what talents did you take? Oh, oh me? Oh, oh. Yeah. Um, let's, let's take a look at what talents I took. Uh, huh? Uh, uh, no. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Who invited you? <laughs> I thought that was clever, but you know, that's fine. Um, so yeah, with the slicer, I took, I had a little bit of XP going in because I didn't pump my stats too much. Um, so I took uh, the first row of specializations or talent tree pieces here. So I took Codebreaker, which removes one setback die per rank in Codebreaker from checks to break codes or decrypt communications. Uh, Decrease difficulty of checks to break codes uh, or decrypt communications by one. Uh, I took Grit, which adds a strain threshold. Uh, One thing we didn't talk too much about was uh, your physical health versus your strain. Um, In the game, your strain is what you use typically uh, to take non- 
combat or non-health damage. So it's like wear and tear. It's like stamina. Uh, in a starship, it's actually like your systems strain. So like your navigational systems or your propulsion systems. I thought that would be helpful for uh, Slicer as I would likely be taking a number of strain as I perform actions to try to get break into things and, and open doors and break systems. Technical aptitude reduces time needed to complete computer related tasks by 25% per rank. Uh, and again, I took just the one rank there to try and make things quicker when I'm doing them. And uh, I took the first rank of bypass security, which is remove one setback die per rank of bypass security from checks made to disable a security device or open a locked door. I also took one more item down the far left tree. So the next rank from Codebreaker is defensive slicing. When defending computer systems, add setback die per rank of defensive slicing to the opponent's check. So I can effectively give somebody a setback die if they are trying to break into our computer system. Oh, very cool. I like it. And that is all for my talent tree. All right. I've been kind of... Shall I go next? Oh, yeah. Or do you want to go, Ryan? Oh, feel free to go. Okay. So I just picked two because I spent a lot of points in my characteristics. So I picked Respected Scholar, which lets me downgrade the difficulty of checks to interact with institutes of learning by one level per rank. And then I took Researcher, which lets me remove a setback die per rank from all knowledge checks. And researching a subject takes half the time. Nice. Nice. I want to point out that one of my options is speaks binary, <laughs> ah. <laughs> which just felt silly for a droid. Um, but you get a blue die per rank when directing NPC droids. Interesting. But I don't know how many NPC droids there'll be if we're all PC droids. Yeah. Could be a lot. Maybe. Yeah, be. All our friends are droids. I'm just surrounded by droids. The curse of the droids. Hey, <laughs> hey, we know plenty of non-droids, okay? One of my... Closest friends is a human. Best friends. Yeah, yeah, one of our best friends is a human. <laughs> oh, oh, fantastic. Gosh. Ryan, what did you take? All right. Uh, so for my doctor uh, starting specialization, I went with a surgeon. And originally I had uh, thought to take back to specialist. <laughs> but I decided that's probably not as useful. So I took that away. And went into buying the Force Sensitive Exile specialization. Um, I can't remember how many points that took to buy. I think it might have been 20 or something I like believe, that. Yes. Yes, I believe 20 is right. Yeah. And so I had a few points left over uh, before I spent the rest on Force Powers. And let's see. I know Surgeon, I didn't go over what that was. That was when I make a medicine check to help a character heal wounds, the target heals one additional wound per rank of Surgeon. Not sure if that's applicable to doing surgery on yourself. Does that even work? Yes. Awesome. Haven't you seen Master and Commander? I have not. You can, in the system, use a medicine check to heal yourself. You just increase the difficulty by one. That works. So, yeah, it would give you an extra... A wound for every success. Perfect. Or one extra plus the number of successes. Okay. That's what I meant. And then uh, for my force sensitive exile, I took uncanny reactions, which adds one bluish square block. I don't know what that means. It's that a boost die. A boost oh, die. one boost <laughs> die. Okay. Per rank of uncanny reactions to all vigilance checks. Oh, nice. Okay. Um, and... I was debating on getting rid of this one, but I think I might need it. I took Forager, um, which allows me (laughs) to remove two black dye from skill checks to find food, water, or shelter. Well, that's good because we don't. Yeah, exactly. That's why I kept it. Because I'm like, (laughs) they're not going to feed me or give me water or shelter. I got to find all that for myself. You're on your own, buddy. Yeah, pretty much. So, well, of course, we're gonna do that. We, I mean, you got to take care of the things you're responsible for, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, we we do. We, we we are the one who got a human. We have to walk him and <laughs> yep. feed him and do our best to simulate love. Human you know, we got to be responsible pet owners. Exactly. I've heard they're very good for <laughs> all of your various conditions. <laughs> <laughs> like like four droids and a medic. <laughs> That's the name of the podcast, Four Droids and a Medic. (laughs) (laughs) We're Four Droids and a Medic. 
We'll work on our theme song. Yep. Yeah, that's the challenge now. Oh, is I... Somebody has to come up with a theme song. <laughs> All it. right, hold on. <laughs> I'm going to need some time, but I got it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't got it, like, right now, but no. it would help if we had names. <laughs> well, we'll get there, yeah, maybe. I, I've got a name for my character, but I think I might change it. I don't know. I just put in a, one of my standard human names. What's your standard? I was just going to put some letters and numbers together and see what happens. Yeah. What's your standard human name? Well, I I had a uh, character in um, The Old Republic uh, who was a Jedi, but can't really be a Jedi in Edge of the Empire. But I just used that name, which is one of my go-to names. Uh, Edric. It's a good name. Edric? I don't have, Edric. I don't have Solid. a last name, though. Noun verber. Oh. Always. <laughs> Edric Surgeon Meister. <laughs> no, that is not my name. Blade well, Cutter? Gonna... That sounds uh, kind of badass. Edric, Edric uh, Droid Pet? I don't know. <laughs> 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 I don't know why my parents had this name. Organ Masher? <laughs> Every time we introduce you, we introduce you with a different last name. Nobody's ever sure what it is. That's probably And good. every time you try to correct us, we're like, be quiet, human. Yeah. I might have actually... You uh, will respond either, to what we tell you to respond to. I might have actually even dropped my last name, or I go under an alias to protect my family. Um, because if my real last name were to be discovered, um, and I'm a quote-unquote known force user my family could be kind of uh, strong-armed into possibly giving up my position. Or killed. Yeah, or killed. Or, yeah, any number of things. Then I'll have to uh, look into the sunset. Can we adopt this human? (laughs) Are we allowed to legally adopt him? (laughs) I'm not sure in the Edge of Empire if, if legal adoption is a thing, like... Do people you know what? It doesn't matter. Do There's no I don't recognize any legal authority yeah, anyway. Exactly. It's like given the state of the universe, like, are we really gonna spend our time in like legal quandaries about adoption? Yeah. Well, I did choose to only So be, we'll just uh, give you a series of letters and numbers as a last name, oh, and now go. you're part of our family. <laughs> Edric, K24. That, that's yeah, that's how it works, I think. Yeah, might as well. If you give someone a droid name, they're a droid. Exactly. Um, I did go with a relatively One young age, too. One of us. Ooh. Uh, 19. Oh, so that's I'm, a good Star Wars it's age. a baby human. Yeah. So I'm a, I'm a baby human. Yeah. Oh, we can't fix him now. He's not fully mature. Yeah. Not until he's 25. <laughs> he can't even rent spaceships. Yeah. <laughs> I think the chastity belt is our best idea. Uh-oh. Okay, you guys. I still go with a shot collar. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but he might start liking that. You know, humans, they're so weird. Uh, we're just making more editing for Ryan. Come <laughs> sorry, on. Sorry, sorry. I'm sorry. A- what is the next step? <laughs> I'm uh, four skills. margaritas in. All right. So some skills, huh? Yep. Did anybody else? I didn't I didn't buy any skills. I did. I did. Uh, yeah, I, okay. I also did not Should buy skills. I, have? Um, I didn't have any points left. <laughs> You don't have then to. You, then, yeah, if you didn't have any points left. Well, it's, I mean, I could, like, it is hard to buy skills without points. I could adjust, you know, I could make some adjustments, but. Well, keep in mind, wanna... when you picked your career, you had those career skills yeah. and the specialization skills that right. give you training in that those particular right. skills. Mm-hmm. And to upgrade your skills, a career skill is five times the rank. Non-career skills are five times the rank plus five. Mm-hmm. So it costs more to get those. Okay. It's not uncommon for you to not spend money on skills to start with, to just go on those career skills, because that's what your training is in. Cool. You trained right. on these things. That's exactly what I decided to do. Well, I mean, I feel like as a droid, I have a pretty limited, you know. Yeah. This like, is what I was, you know, programmed, trained, whatever mm-hmm. to do. Yeah. I took a, a rank in perception. And then I took a rank in ranged light because I figured a droid who was in the army would have those things. Mm-hmm. That's the only two skills I took training in. That's the only all the points I had left. Nice. What about you, Michael? Did you buy a couple things? Yeah, I, I bought two points. I bought a point in charm. Um, again, uh, going along that protocol droid kind of 
trying to be slick and deceptive route. And then I also took one point in computers, which I already had some in for my career. So it made computers uh, a pretty strong skill for the character in general. Nice. That works. Yeah, and then... What about you, Ryan? I didn't get... Oh, I also took a point in ranged light because, again, you got to be able to protect yourself. Yeah. Sorry, Ryan. No, that's all right. <laughs> um, for myself, I didn't get any skills because I put the rest of my points into my force powers. And I know nobody else has force powers, so if nobody else has skills, I could cover what force powers I took. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it sounds like Emily and I are on the same page of yeah, no, I not spending points on things. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Let me just pull those up quick. Not doing math. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I felt like for a droid, I got a lot of skills through my career, yeah. at least to start with. Yeah, I didn't feel like there was a lot of stuff that I you yeah. know, had to have. I maybe could have learned how to use a weapon, but I'm a protocol droid, so. Yeah. Now... For for the Force, in Edge of the Empire specifically, there's three Force power trees. There's the Move tree, uh, which is your, your basic Force push and pull and all that stuff. Uh, influence, which is uh, what the Jedi mind trick stuff and whatnot, right? Talks about twisting the feelings and thoughts of others and different types of control and duration and all that sort of fun stuff. Ooh. Um, and there's, yes. yeah, and there's also the sense force power tree, which is, uh, you know, opening yourself to the force and, and the world around you and, and sensing the un, uh, sensible without it, I guess. Uh, sense has to do with knowing where living beings are within an mm -hmm. area mm -hmm. and then kind of knowing the emotional state of a target that you yeah. are focusing on. Okay. I sense the presence I don't remember the quote. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, no, that's a good example. Though, uh, when Vader was standing up there and he says, I sense the presence of my old master. Yeah. That's a perfect one for sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I actually took um, two different abilities in the sense tree. So I took the sense basic power because that starts at the top of the tree and you can't take anything without taking that one. Right. Correct. Um, that basically the force user can sense f the force interacting with the world around them and can sense living things and, or emotional states, like you said. Um, but then I took a, uh, the, one of the controls for sense thoughts. Um, so okay. I can spend a, a force point. I think that's what that is, right? Yes. Uh, and the force user senses the current thoughts of one living target with whom they are engaged with. So th that could be useful with some of the other uh, meat baggy type of opponents that we might fight. <laughs> yep. Awesome. Um, and then I put most of my points into the, uh, the move force tree because I want to eventually, I wanted to eventually get down to the final control, which is allows you to manipulate items as if you were using your own hands on them. Ooh. That, Ooh. that takes a while to get to, but I wanted to get a good head start on it. So I took the basic power of move, which I can move small objects with the power of the force. Default maximum range is short range, and it looks like you can upgrade a lot of it uh, as you get on the tree. So I put in two extra categories of range right away, which allowed okay. me to get to the control upgrade of hurl. So Ooh. I can hurl objects oh, to damage to damage targets. Correct. Yeah. Um and dealing damage equals ten times the silhouette value. Okay. Now one thing I would just to back you up. Yeah. Right now you can move an object of silhouette zero. Which so would be that's... undamaging. Yep. Cause Hurl, the way it reads, is it's 10 times the silhouette. Okay. So a silhouette zero is like a small object. Mm -hmm. Like that's a person is silhouette one. So effectively, it would be um, more of an annoyance than anything. Yeah. If you wanted to Well, you swap, could throw a Jawa. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's true. Yeah. I mean, rules is written if you yeah. wanted to swap range for a strength. Um, well, you need both ranges to get to that hurl oh, that's right. thing. And the real one that I wanted to get to was the force pull. 
yep. which I need that hurl to get to. So yep. I actually took the force pull as well. Um, and okay. I wanted to start off uh, with those sorts of force powers, but be, you know, basically a novice at it. Okay. So it kind of makes sense that my my ability to hurl objects at people is just an annoyance at this point. See, and that... I just imagine you, like, in the in the back of the ship, like, throwing, like, rubber band balls at us. <laughs> <laughs> and I imagine some of us who may who might be on the less smart side thinking this is like how all humans are or mm-hmm. all like organic beings. <laughs> Get away from me. Or just automatically assuming we're under. Yeah. Attack. Yes. <laughs> Box of paper clips. <gasps> What's happening? Little tiny magnet spheres. Don't throw magnets. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's going to mess up some of my upgrades. Come on. Oh, uh, hey, it wasn't me. Just the stuff I imagine you threaten us with magnets fairly frequently. (laughs) It's the only way I stay alive. (laughs) Don't make me get the magnets. (laughs) And they're all shaped like really cute and adorable things. Yeah. See, being a game master, I would say to you, you know what? Rules is written, say it's 10 times the silhouette. You're using silhouette zero. Mm -hmm. I'll meet you halfway. It does five points of damage. Right. That way, as a character, you're still being able to do stuff. It's just not quite as effective as it should be right exactly or could be i would imagine and, that like you could launch a wrench with the force and they would do a decent chunk of damage oh yeah you know you don't have to throw a person sized thing to do you know 10 points of damage or whatever yep absolutely nope, cool. but be careful with that, those statues yeah <laughs> that just just duck better <laughs> um and the way damage works in the system is it's got a every Every weapon has a base damage. You take that base damage and then you add the number of successes you have. So, for example, with Hurl, if I said, okay, I'll meet you halfway and it's five points, Mm -hmm. if you have three successes, you're actually doing eight points of damage. And then they take off their soak, which is like damage reduction. Okay. That makes sense. So, that's how, as a game master, I would work that out if I was going to run a game with this character you're making. Very cool. Thank you for joining us for part one of this character creation series. We'll be back in part two, picking up right where we left off. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts and guests, or even some of our character sheets. Character Creation Cast can be found on Twitter at CreationCast. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used in today's guests can also be found in the show notes. If you like the systems discussed and wish to purchase them, links to the product can be found in the show notes. Also, check the notes or the website for cool stuff to go with each character, such as dice or mixtapes. Thanks for joining us, and remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation, so go out there and create some amazing people. We will see you next time. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit OneShotPodcast.com, where you'll find other great shows like Adventure. Adventure is a bi-monthly actual play podcast hosted and created by Pranks Paul. Adventure brings your favorite shows and characters to life, combining fan fiction and tabletop into a delicious, chaotic sandwich.